Welcome to reInvent in this series, How to Reinvent American Foreign Policy. I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of reInvent. I'm going to be helping moderate a little bit behind the scenes for this conversation today. Now, today we're going to focus on what is the foreign policy of the millennial generation? Is it distinct, and how is it distinct from other generations, really, to think about it? And as we look at that, we're also going to be thinking, is it really progressive the way we normally think of progressive? That's our question for the day. And the reason this is important, it's getting increasingly important, is the millennial generation is now, depending on who set, defines it, it's now age 35 to age 18. All of them presumably can actually have the opportunity to vote in this period here. They are the biggest generation in American history by far. By some estimates, it's more like about 85 million of them. They're far bigger actually now than the baby boomers, the other big uh, generation in American history. And the boomers have kind of been dominating politics for quite a while here, for better or worse. And we're about to see them, as they're starting to fade out of the scene and literally start to die off, we're watching the millennials now just come of age and start to really make their mark big. So anyone who has to think about how American foreign policy may be reinvented in the coming decades has to start to wrap their head around what does this millennial generation believe, what do they really value, and how do they see America's role in the world. And so to help us in this conversation today, this roundtable conversation, we've got a perfect person to do this. We've got Eli Perez there. Now, Eli is one of the co-founders of Upworthy. Uh, and Upworthy is, uh, you could say, tracks the zeitgeist of that generation and other generations, but that generation predominantly, and also helps shape it. They've had, I think, 1.5 billion minutes of, of attention uh, uh, since they started up. He also was the executive director of MoveOn.org. MoveOn has, about, in, under his kind of time, was about 5 million folks in that organization. And he helped co-found Avaz.org, which is kind of a global uh, move on, which has something now about 30 million members, and in fact is all out there in the foreign policy land of uh, the rest of the world. So he's a perfect person to actually help steer this conversation. Uh, so I want to thank Eli for taking the time to kind of do this. I also want to thank our uh, partners in the series, the Plowshares Fund, and three individuals have really have kind of supported these efforts from the beginning. That's Guy Saperstein, Daniel Berger, and Katrina Vanderhoevel. All three of them have been great from the start. Now, it's not just Eli. We've got a great group today. It's kind of an all-star group, in my opinion, coming from all over the different kind of uh, the country here to actually have this discussion. And so we're going to go around the table, as we always do, and just have a brief introduction from everybody about who they are and what they bring to the table. And we're going to start with Ilya Shaman, and he's the executive director of Move On, uh, the Move On Political Action right now. And so, Ilya, do you want to give us a little bit more of your background? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, and as Pete said, I'm Ilya Shaman. I'm the executive director of MoveOn.org Political Action. We're about 8 million person strong progressive community of ordinary Americans who make our voices heard and build progressive power. Uh, and, you know, the reason I'm here, I think, besides uh, being squarely in the millennial cohort, uh, is that my own experience very closely tracks, I think, the experience of a lot of our generation, from being in school and being an activist, standing up against the war in Iraq, which was very much my first uh, formative political experience, to now, to over the years, watching the rise of an anti-war presidential candidate, in Barack Obama, watching the pros and cons of what that administration could look like, up to uh, this past summer, uh, helping lead the fight to support the president's diplomacy with Iran, and seeing the growing and maturing um, foreign policy sort of progressive movement all across the country. So I'm excited for this conversation, uh, both to talk about the outside and sort of the grassroots view on foreign policy, and also um, how we've been shaped over these past uh, 15, 16 years. Great to have you here. Uh, next, we've got Taylor Jo Eisenberg, and she's the Vice President of Networks at the Roosevelt Institute. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your background? Sure. Um, hi. Uh, I currently serve as Vice President of Networks, which no one knows what that means at the Roosevelt Institute, but uh, I support our network um, of emerging thinkers and doers across the country. We have a presence on 130 college campuses in 40 states and support a burgeoning network of young professionals, uh, all committed to uh, policy change across the country. Uh, we Part of what brings me to this conversation is we recently did a massive survey of our network uh, looking at their opinions in 2016 and where they stand, and foreign policy is one of the ones 
these or one of the issues where we found some really interesting trends that I'm excited to talk a little bit about. Um, I also have a personal spin on this. I grew up in the foreign policy community. I uh, started out as a SCOVO fellow um, and have as a result, a lot of thoughts and opinions about the way that we bring in uh, individuals into the space and where they stand and how they're reacting to the old guard versus the new guard conversation. I'm excited to talk about that as well. Terrific. Great to have you here. Next, we've got Stanislas Fanort. Uh, Fanort. He's the, a Wrangell Fellow at the State Department, and he will be joining the U.S. Foreign Service come uh, 2017. Do you want to give us a little bit more about your background? What brings you here? Hello, uh, uh, nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Stanislaus Fannard, and uh, the Wrangell Fellowship is uh, a fellowship that seeks to uh, bring in more uh, diversity into the, the Foreign Service, uh, and we define that very broadly, you know, diversity in terms of uh, race, uh, sexual orientation, gender, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, and it's a program that seeks to train young people uh, and prepare them uh, for a career in the in the foreign service. Uh, so I'm excited to uh, talk about how uh, maybe uh, that program, uh, which seeks to get a lot of millennials at the moment uh, into the uh, foreign policy, uh, how that affects um, you know what foreign policy will look like in a you know in the next five to ten years. Um, I'm also uh, a former Fulbrighter. I did a Fulbright teaching English in uh, uh, Paris. Uh, so I'd also I'm also looking forward to talking about how cultural exchange could uh, affect foreign policy. Great to have you here. Next we've got Robert Krishank. Good to have you here. Your camp minister of democracy for Robert, you want to give us a little more? Happy to uh, do so, and thank you for having me on this uh, important conversation. Uh, you know. I've been uh, just barely inside the millennial generation by most uh, definitions, and like Ilya, sort of tracking uh, the influence of foreign policy on our generation's uh, views of ourselves and views of our role in the world, from you know marching in the streets against uh, the war in Iraq to teaching uh, college students here at the University of Washington for several years about American politics, government, and foreign policy. Now working at Democracy for America, which in many ways carries on an important aspect of millennial activism. You know, Howard Dean's campaign in 2004 really kickstarted, I think, a lot of uh, the conversations about, you know, how we shape a millennial foreign policy. A lot of millennials reacted very favorably to what Dean was talking about and have tried to carry on that legacy going forward. Um, one of the things I'm really interested to hear today is, you know, what exactly America's role in the world should be and where millennials are positioning themselves in the world and where they want to see the United States position itself in the world. Uh, I think we have a lot of opportunities, a lot of threats right now. Uh, and I think millennials are right at the right moment in uh, history to help really pivot uh, this country potentially in a very progressive direction. Uh, but there are a lot of headwinds, and it'll be interesting to see how millennials handle that. Great to have you. Um, the next, and finally here, we have Sarah Margon, and she's the Washington Director at Human Rights Watch. Sarah, do you want to give us a little more on the background? Hi, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I... Um, as you probably know, Human Rights Watch is a research uh, organization that covers 90 plus organization, uh, countries and regions around the world. So my job as the Washington director is to basically promote any, our research and engage with the U.S. government on any number of issues from ISIS, Syria, Iraq to Burundi, crises, conflicts, um, and countries where abuses are rampant. Um, I've been here for about three and a half years, and prior to that, I uh, was at the Center for American Progress and was a uh, foreign policy advisor with Senator Feingold from Wisconsin. Uh, I am squarely outside the millennial generation, um, but think increasingly as I watch foreign policy and participate in foreign policy making here in Washington, the conversation about non-state actors is not just about the bad guys, but it's also about civil society, it's about Americans, and it's about how governments can engage beyond just the traditional way of making um, policy. And so I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. Great to have all of you here, and I uh, just want to make a reminder for those that are watching it live, uh, if you want to ask questions or add your ideas on our website, reinvent.net, do so, and also in Twitter, you can use the hashtag, hashtag reinvent. Uh, but now it goes over to Eli, and Eli is going to basically frame the conversation and uh, start right in. Eli? Uh, 
Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is an extraordinary group of people, and I'm honored to be here with you all. Um, I am uh, reporting in from the very smallest room in Upworthy headquarters. And uh, I wanted to uh, get into today's conversation uh, by reflecting on two things. One is, uh, you know, there's a cliche in foreign policy thinking about fighting the last war. And the idea is that um, we're often too busy looking over our shoulder at the threats and circumstances behind us to notice uh, what's about to trip us up uh, and to adapt to the changing world that we now live in. And I don't think that that's a, it's a coincidence that that, uh, that cliche, you know, emerged in a foreign policy context because I think that uh, the history of American foreign policy in many ways is uh, a series of corrections and overcorrections, uh, you know, frequently overshooting the mark in the other direction. And so um, I, I'm really excited to engage in a conversation about uh, how we actually look ahead, uh, not just at the issues that have uh, stumped us in the past, but what are the new, uh, what's the new terrain that we're going to be facing in the next 20 years? Um, the second thing is, I, I'm really interested to talk about how millennials view the world differently based on the uh, experiences we've lived through. And um, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of research that every generation is shaped by the historical events that happened during the time when they were coming to age. Um, and arguably, millennials is actually too broad a category in that sense, because you have uh, early millennials who are older, who uh, came of age kind of in the late George Bush, early Obama hope and change era. And then you have uh, late millennials who are younger, who uh, came of age sort of during the Obama presidency, don't remember the Bush stuff, uh, and actually like have a fairly different set of views. Um, and so I think, it, you know, there's always a challenge of how do you talk about a generation as a whole when it's composed of a lot of people who feel very differently. But I thought an interesting place to start the conversation would be, you know, what do we see as the kind of formative events and um, factors that help shape how millennials think about foreign policy. And uh, what are both the obvious things? I think uh, for many of us on this call, and me certainly, uh, the Iraq war was an incredibly, you know, September 11th and the Iraq war was an incredibly kind of formative event. And um, I have a, I have a one-year-old son, and it always is sort of mind-boggling to realize that for him, September 11th is is something that happened in history long before he was born. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the kind of central uh, event that existed for, for those of us on the call, I think. But what are the things that are not as obvious also that would have shaped, uh, you know, how this generation views foreign policy? Can I, can I make some comments on this one? Jump in. Yeah, that's right. Jump sure. in. Great. So I think there's a couple of things. I was, I was going to say, obviously, 9-11, the Iraq War, Afghanistan. But I think, you know, if you look a little bit, you scratch the surface a little bit, and you look at some of the other things, um, I think the torture programs that the Bush administration started have had a very lasting and significant legacy. The secrecy, not only around those programs, but overall, I would say, across both the Bush and the Obama administration, the increased governmental secrecy has been a tremendously um, difficult and uh, infuriating thing, I think, for a lot of young people who expect to know what their government is up to and want to know and want to be able to weigh in. So I would also add that. I would say America's role in the world overall has been an ongoing question. Obviously, in the first part um, of the millennial uh, generation, you've got the Bush administration, this you're either with us or you're against us mentality. You know, even I recall in college going, traveling abroad and people saying, oh, she's American, oh, she hates us, you know, and having that, um, that sort of define what it meant to be American and then the reparations that the Obama administration has sought to do to re-engage both the norms and the framework, sometimes to good, sometimes sort of 
poorly, but an effort to re-engage globally have been tremendously important. And then finally, I would just say um, what we see increasingly is a global activism that I think defines is defined by social media in part, but an interest in getting engaged, not just here in America, but growth of civil society across continents from you know, from Asia to, to Africa, where there previously hadn't been strong civil societies that are able to connect with Americans, to voice their opinions, and to be part of a larger global conversation about what it means to be um, an individual within a larger society. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd just like to build off of Sarah's point uh, in terms of the global activism. Uh, with the millennial generation, we've clearly seen an increase of students uh, studying abroad uh, in, or, and perhaps even working abroad. For me in particular, in my alma mater at Northeastern, I spent about a year and a half abroad uh, working and studying, uh, mainly in Francophone Africa, and that was just a normal thing for a lot of students to, to do, to spend at least a year abroad. So I think that uh, sort of, uh, I guess, cultural exchange um, will definitely uh, is definitely a major factor in our generation. You know, along with uh, you know 9/11, uh, the rise of social media, uh, and all these uh, the Bush era as well. Um, but I, I think definitely cultural exchange is just really going to play a, a role uh, moving forward um, as we try to get to know uh, more about other countries and be more culturally sensitive. And I think that's another reason why our generation is less, uh, I would say, afraid of uh, outside uh, forces and outside countries than previous generations. Uh, I definitely think that that actually plays into it, uh, as well as having a bunch of students uh, come here through various programs, through the Fulbright program, uh, to engage with us. So. Cool. Let's go to Robert. What do you think, Robert? Yeah. Uh, you know, everything that's been said so far is great. I just want to add three other things uh, that stand out to me. First is uh, the impact of the Snowden revelations about the NSA and what is being done, sort of to Sarah's point, what is being done in our name in the war on terror. I think that the Snowden revelations in particular have really destroyed millennial trust in uh, the national security state and the foreign policy apparatus who have justified a massive uh, intrusive spying system uh, on the basis of national security and millennials are reacting very negatively to that and they're reacting more negatively I think than most other generations. But I think what that does is it helps uh, poison the well in many ways for uh, millennials to respond to what they hear from the foreign policy establishment. Uh, the second thing I think is worth uh, noting is the Arab Spring. I think that has had a really interesting impact on how millennials view the world I think and it reverberated a little bit in the United States with Occupy, and I think it's still reverberating both around the world and here in the United States, where millennials saw mostly young people, although not exclusively, rising up and facing state violence in order to liberate themselves from oppression. And I think that left a lasting mark on a lot of millennials about how they view the world and how they view America's role in the world. I think, to get to the third point, you know, the, millennials don't seem to have much of a sense of American exceptionalism. I think when they looked at using social media in particular, People like them or people who they could identify with in the streets of Tahrir Square or in Syntagma Square in Athens or in uh, Zuccotti Park in New York, they started to see possibilities. They started to see opportunities and realize that our government should be supporting this and not necessarily fighting back against it. I think that story, especially the Arab Spring and how Americans think about, millennial Americans think about what it means for our role in the world, is still an unfolding story. But I think it's something that I'm certainly watching over the next five to ten years to see what it really means for how millennials think our power should be used abroad. So I want to go to Taylor, but before I do, Robert, I'm just curious, you know, the Arab Spring, I agree, was a big moment. Uh, obviously, you know, sort of phase one of the Arab Spring uh, uh, had a different kind of impact than phase two, where... Um, you know, it's been a pretty mixed uh, bag in terms of the long-term consequences for democracy uh, and where a lot of those countries have landed. Um, can you just tell, like, what do you think of that? What, 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 what does that say to you, and, and what do you think people took away from it? Yeah, I think it's an excellent point, and I think, uh, you know, the Arab Spring has turned into Arab winter in some places. Uh, but what I, what I think happened was, you know, millennials saw, and you saw even this in, in the occupation in Wisconsin in 2011, People saw that as an opportunity, as a vision of what could be. 
And I think that vision is still there. I think there's a sense that it's become harder to attain, but the frustration with the uh, centers of power, both in the United States and around the world, are certainly growing. Lack of trust and faith in institutions is growing. And I think what happened in the Arab Spring still exists in the minds of a lot of millennials when they think about what could be possible around the world. And maybe, you know, if that happens again, uh, there may be more of a desire to help support that uh, than there had been, certainly in the United States, where the Obama administration gave a lot of verbal support, but their role turns out to have been more mixed, uh, as it turned out. Uh, let's go to Taylor and then Sarah. Uh, I think uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Arab Spring piece in particular. Um, yeah, so actually my first point was going to be one that might slightly contradict the one right before me. Um, I was going to call it the disappointment of the Arab Spring. Uh, and I think one of the things we still have to grapple with is the uh, that experience in a lot of ways. So it's interesting. I'd actually argue there's three phases of millennials. I think there's kind of the Howard Dean generation. I think there was the elect Obama generation. And then I think there's the group that's only ever known an Obama presidency. Uh, and I think for a lot of us, the Arab Spring was our first sense of optimism about massive change. And then to have it play out the way it did, it has real implications for the faith of institutions, but then also a belief that um, overcoming entrenched interests is a possibility um, without or in the immediate future. So I think that's an interesting question. I think it also you know, aligns with this, uh, the rise in the conversation that democracy is a nuance or a, a nuisance um, and this uh, kind of disturbing rise of commentary around the China model. Um, I think the second thing I would say is the global economic crisis, um, I think has profound implications for the way millennials view and engage with the world. Um, and then I think the third is immigration. Uh, we talk a lot about the fact that uh, millennials are the most diverse generation that we've ever seen, and a lot of that has to do um, with uh, the rise in um, uh, the growth of the Hispanic population. And so I think as we think more about the way that communities here in the U.S. are connecting with communities abroad, um, the way that borders become less of a defining feature um, of sense of family and connection uh, will increasingly define the way uh, millennials and, you know, the U.S. interacts with the world. Great. Sarah? Thanks. You know, I think the Arab Spring presents a lot of very positive uh, illustrations as well as a lot of negative indications of, of, sort of where it's not just you know I think millennial where millennials are but also again to my point on non-state actors I mean what you had was very angry many disenfranchised individuals who felt that their governments weren't listening to them and they stood up for the most part very peacefully and in most cases except Tunisia we've now seen a complete rollback of any of the successes. I don't think it negates or reverses the need for peaceful protests and individual citizen engagement, but it, do, it shows both the power of those individuals, but then it also shows the extent to which governments who are worried about being undermined or thrown out are willing to go to respond, Syria being the most egregious example, Egypt being not all that far behind, even though it looks comparatively quite stable, and then um, you know you have a mix of other of other situations, but I do think what it shows is the power again of of social media of communication um, and of civil society to work together across all from all spectrums. Right? I mean, Egypt is the example where you have you have the Muslim you have the Muslim Brotherhood meeting and working collectively in Tahrir Square with sort of the liberal old elite intellectuals in Cairo and that bridge that was formed is an incredible indication for future generations that it is possible to work together to make change. Where it brings millennials in the U.S. to I find to be a very interesting place because for a very long time the U.S. wouldn't let go of Mubarak. They were reluctant to do so because at least they knew who he was even if he was abusive and authoritarian. And so what it shows me actually is the millennial push here at home in the United States for the U.S. to support institutions as opposed to individuals and redouble and double down on an effort to support individuals as much as they support institutions. It govern, it's not just about governments, it's about the people of those countries is essential. And I think you saw you see that increasingly in millennials who engage the U.S. Um, institutions here, whether it's Congress or it's the executive branch. There is this push now from young Americans to look beyond those traditional diplomatic arrangements and think about what the impact is on civil society or the impact is on acad uh, academic institutions. And that's pretty remarkable right. to me. 
So let me bring Ilya into the conversation. And Ilya, I'm curious about two things here in particular. Uh, one is, you know, there's sort of a, a conversation that we're having here about people power and where millennials net out on that after uh, the Arab Spring and the Arab Winter, after the first part of the Obama administration and the rest part of rest of the Obama administration. I'm curious for your take on that. Um, and then I'm curious also, as someone who runs an organization that is very internet uh, native, um, you know, how do you see uh, the rise of social media and the rise of the internet as the dominant form, you know, platform for communication as shaping how people understand and think about uh, foreign policy? Sure. And, you know, I think the, this theme that's emerged around state actors or civil society is really important. You know, in the, the comment about the global financial crisis, I think one impact of that in the U.S. was seeing um, U.S. financial institutions fail, seeing leaders entirely discredited for what they'd said for years about what would happen to the economy, built on what had happened with Iraq. That there was a total loss of faith in institutions uh, in sort of having a secret plan or being able to guide uh, foreign policy or being able to guide the economy. And so at the same time, you know, I think the other trend that's happening that is connected to this question about the internet is this is the first generation that's living with the impacts of climate change in a real way day to day. So whether it's Australia where you've had decades of drought and literally land disappearing or low-lying islands, or if you look at the U.S. and look at just the radical weather patterns we've been seeing. And so what you're seeing is a broader global identity emerging by virtue of the fact that climate uh, affects everyone around the world, climate change does in very different ways, that the solutions have to be global in nature, and that the Internet actually mediates communication not at the government-to-government -government level, but at the citizen-to-citizen -citizen level. And so as I look at, you know, the next five, ten years, as you look at, you know, we're currently living through the largest refugee crisis since World War II, largely from North Africa and the Middle East, but even in the U.S. you're seeing from Central America. I think what you're going to see is as the challenges become more common around the world, whether it's migration of peoples or other impacts of climate change, you're going to see more and more Internet-mediated, person-to-person, community-to-community, civil society to civil society communication that simply bypasses government as the faith in governments being able to solve problems diminishes and people look for people-powered alternatives that are done at the person-to-person -person or community-to-community -community level. And that's going to be mediated by social media, it'll be mediated by the Internet, and ultimately it'll be the question will be, how can those social movements achieve political power? And I think that's a place where there's still much more to learn and to discover in the years ahead. Do you think, I mean, uh, do you think people are in a place of, of optimism that they can or cynicism that they can't? Or where, do you, where would you put folks on that spectrum at this time? I mean, I'd say in the U.S. context, we've gone from putting, you know, the Obama era of putting our faith in a president to try to solve problems to now vibrant social movements on issue after issue that sort of are willing to bypass governments that are stuck and actually achieve change nonetheless. So I think it's a period of optimism, a period of, you know, yes, we can, but one rooted not in the ability of decision makers to solve problems, but of vibrant movements. And I'll just give one more example, which is remember, uh, when er the Iraq war happened, people started mobilizing sort of in the weeks before the war and after it started. Two years ago, you had a mass mobilization globally to prevent a war in Syria, uh, US and Western intervention in the war in Syria, that headed off a war before the US or Britain got involved, notwithstanding the civil war that was happening. Uh, in the summer, you had US civil society rally for diplomacy in a proactive frame. So you're seeing civil society move from a defensive, reactive posture responding to politicians to actually starting to set the terms of the debate. And I think that's exciting, and the question is, how far can that go in defining proactive foreign policy, diplomacy for solutions, and actually addressing climate change uh, in spite of op opposition from those with institutional and entrenched power? So I'd love to ask the other panelists, you know, on this, on this theme of arguably, you know, the technological shift that uh, we've seen in the last 20 years is one of the very largest kind of macro uh, changes that's that's happened uh, that that affects the context here, um, and I'm sure there are. I'd be curious to hear other and especially other kind of non-obvious ways in which 
uh, the rise of uh, global communication has changed uh, the foreign policy context. One of the things I was just looking at was a, a Cato Institute report uh, that was talking about actually, uh, you know, I think millennials tend to be much less uh, afraid of the rest of the world as a rule than generations in the past, and I wonder if, uh, you know, just uh, actually having contact is part of that. But I'm curious, what, what are the other ways in which uh, technology is shifting the terms on which people think about foreign policy? Can I say one thing? Yeah, go. So very much from the Washington perspective, um, you know, I think one of the things that President Obama has started to do with some regularity that's been pretty remarkable is he does video messages for people in different countries. So whether it's to wish, you know, the Persian community um, a happy Norwars or, you know, a warning to the Burundian people that the U.S. is watching what their government is doing. This is an incredibly effective way to reach out to people and to and to let them know he's not just talking to the government or you know his staff isn't just talking to the government even if they don't have television so they don't have internet access they're broadcast on the radio and so the president actually taking steps to do this combined with USAID support for increasing um, radio transmissions in throngs of countries around the world where the US through VOA and other mediums is able to get its message out is tremendously powerful because while you have you have Twitter and you have Facebook um, in many of these capital cities and countries around the world. Outside of that, you have very rural areas where the radio continues to be the real primary area uh, or primary way to reach people. And so this this has been something I think this administration has really built on and has really sought to engage people as, you know, I, I, we, I know foreign diplomats diplomats and even increasingly the military goes to foreign countries and will sit down with civil societies in small communities. That's huge. That's new. Totally. Um, you know, I was thinking about this, this question and I, and I think there are a lot of dimensions to it, but, um, you know, I think one of the ways in which, uh, you know, the, the, the global kind of interconnection is, is shaping uh, how progressives and how, how millennials are, are looking at uh, foreign policy is I think that, you know, there's been this conversation about sort of a, a distrust of institutions, but I think the nation state as the primary place that we affiliate uh, is th the role of the nation state is shifting, right? And I think that um, when you are able to kind of have that tribal experience uh, online, and it could be uh, in other in other pieces of your identity, or it could be literally in your World of Warcraft clan, uh, it displaces some of the nationalistic energy that uh, has traditionally fueled uh, national conflicts. And I don't think we really know how that is going to play out. And certainly, I think it's you could make the argument that, um, in some ways, certainly separatism is on the rise, uh, and and there are ways in which people are clinging more to national identity. But um, but I think that uh, it offers new avenues for uh, the kind of identity that nations have traditionally offered people. Um, and Taylor, I know you have some thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that plays itself out in the fact that you see American millennials, the least patriotic generation we've seen in a very, very long time, um, is is one indication of that in the way they think that the increased use of technology and connection and understanding yourself as a human in the world um, changes what you feel connected to. I think it has definitely influenced that the answer to that question. And I think um, also has decreased, played a huge role in the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, we have two-way conversations now. Um, and I don't think that was as prevalent as it was before. Um, and it, and you know, which I think reinforces a lot of what uh, Sarah was speaking to. Uh, but to, I think there's also a downside to this, um, which I've been really interested in observing the way our network of college and post grads are engaging is that um, as they're flocking to platforms like Avaz, they're seeing the peer to peer engagement, they're working on the ground with other groups, which all to massive benefit, um, they're ignoring the fact that these 
institutions do still have a lot of power and influence. Um, they're not engaging around the questions of United Nations funding. I don't think you saw um, a really broad reach of millennials engaging in a conversation around the Iran deal um, in a way that, you know, could have, for me at least, thinking longer term, had some worrying um, signals. And I think it would, you know, it happened in some communities, but not enough. Um, and, and I think that ranges, you know, who's paying attention to what's happening in these large bureaucracies. Uh, we don't have a progressive infrastructure that's actively sucking in young people, focused in on what these institutions are doing. Um, and, it, you know, the American apparatus is not going to go away. Our institutions, our structures still drive a lot of our presence in the world. So I think the question is, is how do we take the energy that is happening elsewhere, foster it, further it, but also recognize that there is still some at home building we need to do to be influencing our own institutions in a way I think that I've noticed a trend that millennials aren't doing quite as much outside of kind of this cohort of diehards that, um, you know, have carried forward the legacy of the anti-war efforts. Yeah, if I can just build on that and then I want to go to Robert. You know, a theme that I'm hearing underneath a lot of the commentary here is that there's a gap between, you know, we all see where the trend is going and where power lies and that power is moving to, uh, to, to new ways of expressing itself and social movements and that kind of thing. But uh, it's not there yet. And actually, there's still a lot of power in these institutions. And there's this kind of odd gap between... Uh, where people perceive it to be going and where it actually is. And it reminds me a little bit, as someone who's been thinking a lot about the media, um, of the, you have the exact same conversation in when you look at the media landscape, where, um, yes, of course, uh, the Internet is becoming a much bigger source of news. You know the number one source of the news is in America? It's local TV news still, today. <laughs> And uh, if you, you want to reach the most people and you want to reach them with daily news, local TV news is the place that you go. So there's this weird gap between we all know where the ball is headed, but actually there's still a lot of power still locked up in these old institutions, um, and that's not really being addressed. Um, Robert, let me go to, to, to you. Yeah, you know, uh, to your question, I think Taylor had an interesting point about it. Um, I feel like social media in particular, but other forms of communication have, for, especially for American millennials, reduced the otherness of people around the world. They are still different to most American millennials, but it's not quite as foreign. Right? You can sort of understand where someone is coming from. You can understand the concerns they face. You can understand how they're thinking about it. But there's still, I think, a significant gap there to, to be bridged. Uh, and I think that actually helps influence the conversations we we're having just now about the nation state and about these powerful institutions that still exist. I think in particular, American millennials are a little bit further behind uh, their colleagues and cohorts around the world, especially in Europe, in rethinking this. You know, you look, you talked about separatism earlier, Eli. You look at Scotland and Catalonia, two places where millennials are some of the strongest supporters of those secession movements in those places. If it were up to millennial voters in Scotland, uh, they would have voted overwhelmingly to leave the UK. But that wasn't because they wanted to, you know, stop the world, I'm ready to get off. It was they wanted to re-engage Europe and the rest of the world on their own terms uh, without having to mediate it through a more conservative government in London. I feel like here in the United States, we're not quite having those conversations, but I think they're coming. Uh, not necessarily about, you know, the future of the United States as an integrated place, but more, you know, how is the United States engaging around the world you know, is the United Nations still a valuable concept, or do we need to do something different? I feel like American millennials are just on the cusp of that, and maybe it takes a little bit of leadership to move that conversation forward, because I think millennials are ready to engage around the world and ready for a different type of American leadership that is not quite as unilateral as it had been. But right now, that conversation among millennials is really stilted and hasn't really gone as far as I think it should. Great. Um, uh, yes. Yes, uh, yes, I'd just like to add something uh, on Robert's point about, you know, reducing the otherness of uh, other countries uh, uh, compared to previous generations. You know, the, the advancements in technologies have, in a way, kind of uh, been able to inform millennials uh, to a point where millennials have tools now to be able to uh, hold traditional media accountable for not covering certain issues or not covering them, you know, uh, as in-depth as they, as they should be. Uh, and I think that really, you know, has been shaping, uh, in a way, uh, how our Congress works, even. Um, if, if you have uh, 
uh, a new media that's sort of like informing the public uh, in, a, in a different way, uh, in a more, I guess, uh, I guess, impactful way that tells you the whole story, or maybe even like a missing portion of the story. I believe that, in the long run, will affect uh, foreign policy, and that that's essentially being driven by the millennial generation. They're asking for more. They're asking, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, I guess have all the answers uh, to a particular issue. They want to know all the facts uh, before proceeding. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, that's one way technology will continue to play a role. So uh, I want to move on to some other topics, but let's go quickly to Sarah and Peter, uh, Sarah and Ilya, sorry, um, on, on this point. Thanks. I, I wanted Eli to pick up on your point about sort of the centers of power, um, because I think one of the things we see with millennials is that this increased information from the ground, whether it's social media or news or you know other civil society groups, is actually under threat. It risks not only millennials' understanding from the ground up of what's happening in country X, Y, and Z, but also it represents a broader trend from countries from Egypt to Nigeria to Ethiopia to Kenya. Um, to Afghanistan, you see this consistent threat uh, against NGOs where governments are either trying to pass legislation that would restrict them, cut off their foreign funding, which is a terrible problem because in so many of these countries, these groups and media uh, outlets are entirely um, reliant on international funding, and or they restrict their access and movement. And so this is a c consistent problem and a pushback from the power centers of government to tamp down that the, sh the shift in a power center, or at least the rise of civil society, A, because they don't want to be held accountable by outside forces, and B, because they don't want people around the world, in many cases, to know what's happening in their country, because it, you know, wouldn't look good, to put it simply. Right. Oh, yeah. I'll continue in my role of, uh, I guess, resident optimist today, uh, to say that, you know, so we're in the midst of a big foreign policy debate in the U.S. right now about... Uh, refugees. You know, it's mirroring a debate happening in Europe and elsewhere, and if you follow essentially the media conversation, you'll get a pretty uh, frightening portrait of what America thinks about refugees. But And so, yes, one could say, look, millennials don't control the media yet. They're not able to change the conversation. But I actually think the point about creating alternate structures is really important, whether it's an upworthy distributing stories or whether it's humans of New York getting 16 million followers, a community of people on social media that they then use to introduce people to refugees. Uh, and then the president actually following, the president coming in on Facebook, commenting on humans of New York, inviting one of the people profiled to come speak at the State of the Union and breaking into traditional media. I think what that speaks to is the fact that millennials aren't by and large trying to break into traditional power structures not because they're afraid of power, but because they see the ability to create new power structures that then can drag traditional media, drag traditional elites along. And so I think that's a positive development. It's obviously not strong enough yet to counterbalance every single you know, uh, TV station out there, but it is reaching millions of people. And ultimately the question isn't you know, what's going to reach every single American, which clearly local news is still the number one source. But what's going to reach the folks who are going to mobilize, who are going to activate, who are going to be the first adopters, who are going to bring others along? And I'd argue there's a lot of progress already being made on social media by millennials to have a fundamentally different conversation. All right, so we're about halfway through our conversation. We've got a lot uh, to dig into, but I want to do a kind of lightning round since we're halfway through. So I want to ask everyone here, what is the most uh, under under-thought about, under-grappled with uh, a development that's going to shape foreign policy in the next uh, in the next couple of decades. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start uh, to give everyone a little time to think. Uh, I think the demographic shifts uh, globally, um, it's not super, maybe, maybe you could argue that that is a topic of conversation in many places, but I think it's still, even in the United States, way under uh, hyped as just an enormous, enormous shift that will affect everything from immigration patterns to spending patterns to um, how people think about nations. Someone was describing to me that, um, you know, a, a prediction that by uh, 2030 we're going to have sort of uh, gated communities in the 
you know, in the Indias and uh, Brazils and uh, uh, Chinas of the world for Americans where we essentially ex export uh, older folks because that's how the labor markets will work for uh, assistance. Who knows if that's right, but it definitely seems like one of the things that we should be thinking about. So um, let's, uh, who, who's ready with a kind of uh, under undercovered uh, aspect of the, of the foreign policy uh, landscape going forward? I've got one. Great. Um, it, we spent a lot of time thinking about it here in DC, but I'm not sure outside the Beltway. Uh, the role of civilian and military relations, I think it's going to have a tremendous impact because the Pentagon still is the richest agency and does so much of the work that other agents should, agencies should be doing and how that impacts foreign policy and what that means given how uh, opaque the Pentagon tends to be, I think is a tremendously important issue for the future. And just, uh, can you, I'm not sure I, I think I know what you mean, but I'm not sure I know what you mean. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the Pentagon has the largest budget of any other U.S. government agency. Um, it fights the wars, but it also does humanitarian operations. It runs hospitals. It does research. It does security training for other militaries. Um, it, it does a whole bunch of things you wouldn't think it does. And the questions of how that impacts diplomacy, what that means, um, you know, I think how um, we as Americans are able to understand what they're doing at the Pentagon and where the money is going, where U.S. taxpayer dollars are going, and how it can be influenced by Americans is a huge question. Um, many times you see the Pentagon doing the job of the State Department or even of USAID, the development agency, because they simply have more money. That's a problem, and I think that will have a tremendous impact because that promotes abroad and, uh, you know, a, a vision of America as a militarized government and a militarized society when given what so many millennials want is, I would, you know, I understand to be quite the opposite. Great. Uh, Robert. You know, we talk a lot about uh, the potential for climate change to cause disruption to governments, to population movements, to refugee flows. We also talk here in the United States about the potential impact of automation on the American workforce, you know, how many jobs will be destroyed if we have driverless cars, for example. We don't really talk about what that's going to mean around the globe. Uh, if we start seeing a significant move towards automation of a lot of occupations, especially unskilled labor around the planet, what is that going to do to governments? What is it going to do to populations, you know, who may move, want to move to a different place to build a better life or who have an, yet another grievance against the people in power in their own country? I think this is a conversation that we aren't connecting to the global world, the global political system, the way we're trying to connect it to the American economy here at home. Good one. Uh, Taylor, you've got one? Um, I'm actually going to build on yours, Eli's. I'm going to say the demographic shifts, but in the context of the fact we have not cracked the nut, that our resources are, our decreasing resources are increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few. That's a good one. Somewhat grim, but... I, I hear you. <laughs> uh, Ilya, what do you got? Uh, I, I was going to say Robert's point about automation, so instead I'll say, uh, you know, the question of how the future of the Internet will be decided is an important one. You know, does free basic or internet.org or, you know, various uh, quasi-Facebook uh, permutations take off around the world, which restrict net neutrality, or do we get a level playing field that allows truly billions of people to participate in the global conversation. I think that's going to help determine uh, the shape of global activism around the world and how it connects to each other. Great. And Stanislas? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, one thing that I believe uh, is, is definitely going to change the playing field uh, is, uh, like, like as mentioned before, just the increase, the steady increase of uh, uh, global study abroad. Uh, from U.S. To, uh, abroad, uh, you know, we have, there's about a 144% increase, according to a report by the Center for Association Leadership, um, in uh, global study abroad since uh, 1995. So that's, that's major. I think if, you, if you're a person who has, like, a lot of friends abroad, uh, you're going to start working with them on uh, activism issues. Um, 
and you're you're less likely to to have any sort of aggression toward that country. In fact, you'll have more of an understanding of how that country's culture works, why they have certain policies there. Uh, you know, I think that is going to definitely affect uh, us moving forward. I mean, a lot of my best friends are uh, live abroad. They're you know foreigners, so I feel like that's definitely going influ to influence you know how I, I move forward in my career as well. So. Taylor, you had a thought to add. Yeah, I know. I just I feel a little bad being, I think, on the younger end of this crowd and being the most depressing as well. I feel like it doesn't bode well. So I did want to do a quick clarification on my in the sense that um, but I think that trend is gonna lend itself to the boil over or the tipping point. Um, so I think to going back to some of our earlier comments around the Arab Spring and Occupy here in the States, I think um, that trend can't continue um, in the context of demographics. And I think it's gonna lend itself to some positive momentum um, to hopefully change that dynamic. So that's my positive spin on my very grim comment. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and I hope you're right. Um, okay, so uh, we can't have this conversation, you know, we've sort of like uh, touched on the edges of it, but let's talk about it. millennials and intervention. Um, big elephant in the room always in foreign policy, but, um, but I feel this myself, honestly, uh, and, and that may be a little surprising given my history uh, at MoveOn and, and fighting the war in Iraq, uh, which I continue to be uh, you know, very proud of, uh, of my involvement there. But uh, essentially, you know, I think there's a tension that is very real between the kind of Samantha Power, humanitarian, genocide-oriented, uh, uh, you know, we should, we should intervene to um, stop horrific things from happening again, um, and the pragmatic, we can't go around solving the world's problems uh, end of the spectrum. Where do you all see uh, millennials netting out on that? Uh, or are they netting out, or is it just a big ball of complicated feelings? Obviously, the answer is a big ball of complicated feelings, but... Uh, uh, I, can, I can weigh in. Uh, <laughs> So, so human rights watch doesn't take position on intervention, right? And this has been a very interesting. Uh, very rarely do we take a position on where we sort of go through this internal process of, of how we, um, uh, you know, it has to. The, basically, it has to be more, less harmful um, than what's currently going on, a, among other things. But I think what we see for millennials, particularly, is that. I mean, there hasn't been a victory when it comes to war. And so that obviously is a huge consideration that you can just sort of jump in and jump out, I think, as so many diplomats and military officials tell us. Um, but also there's an interest in, as you said, Eli, pushing more for the normative, you know, the Rwandas and the Srebrenica's on sort of empathetic goals for civilian, in favor of civilians, then there is in this sort of big strategic realm because I think it's been long proven that governments that go to war with each other end up, you know, creating a terrible situation that is grinding for sort of the region at large. But if it can be smaller and more nuanced and can focus on saving civilians as opposed to one government versus another, at least that's my sense from talking to a number of millennials that that sort of normative shift has happened um, as opposed to sort of the sole strategic uh, guys. Got it. So, uh, Robert, you had some thoughts. I have a very similar view as to what Sarah just said, and I'll be an optimist here. I think we are seeing a shift among millennials toward, uh, you know, wanting to find a useful and effective way to intervene in those moral moments. I think to the summer of 2014, uh, when we saw the images and stories of the Yazidis in northern Iraq who were facing Daesh coming in uh, and you know, doing awful, awful things, there was a desire among a lot of millennials to do something about it. Uh, but they also understood that you know, following the George W. Bush path of putting a bunch of soldier, American soldiers on the ground was not necessarily the right move. Uh, there was a poll that came out uh, last month in December uh, after the Paris attacks and after San Bernardino where they asked uh, all age groups you know, do you think uh, there should be some sort of military intervention in Syria to deal with Daesh? And millennials ha had a big spike in the number of people who said, yes, there should be. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of millennials who said, but we don't think it necessarily needs to be American troops. We don't necessarily think it needs to be uh, us going and doing the fighting and dying. You know, the, the takeaway I have from this is to go to pop culture for a moment. Uh, you know, when I read that poll, I thought of the movie Taken with Liam Neeson. 
where he's on the phone with a guy who's got his daughter and says, you know, I have a very particular set of skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I feel like millennials look at the military ideally as a Liam Neeson character that can be deployed, you know, in very specific situations to deal with very bad moments and bad people, and then you pull it out right when you would hopefully achieve your goal. I don't know how tenable that actually is in practice. There are a lot of problems with that potentially when it's used. But I feel like that's where millennials are starting to land on this question of how do we intervene and what do we do. If we're going to intervene, it needs to be very limited, almost surgical in scope. Uh, but we've all seen mission creep. We've all seen that uh, spiral out of control. And I think this is something that millennials are really going to have to grapple with, especially as the world becomes less and less secure and less and less stable. Robert, I think this conversation is going to be known as the place where the Liam Neeson doctrine uh, was first elaborated. So thank you for that. Um, Let's go to Taylor. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't think I have uh, now too much to add. I, I would just say that um, I think that it's almost like 20 percentage points difference in opinions on what like what should be your reason for intervening. The silent generation um, is often for it's much more heavy on force when it comes to uh, national interests and millennials. It's for humanitarian reasons is the primary reason. And we did a um, survey. So we surveyed about a thousand of our members uh, and asked that question: What are the most important? Um, foreign policy issues and what came in second um, was intervening in human rights abuses uh, at 22%. So I think that speaks a lot to some of the points that other folks have made. And I, I also thought a lot about it, and again, as someone who came, when I described the three phases of people earlier, the Dean generation, the elect Obama, and then the post Obama presidency, I would say my experience is to be the second and of, you know, being the generation or the folks of the millennials that elected um, Obama. And I often reflected as someone who was still in high school when a lot of the anti-war demonstrations for Iraq and Afghanistan were happening, why there kind of didn't become what we saw had seen in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think that there are some slight, um, not slight, some real differences in this generation's response um, that's driven by a lot of very complex factors, um, but speak to why we've seen not a wholesale rejection. And, and a lot of people talk about the rise of isolationism among this generation, which I think is a real mischaracterization, um, but why the response has been very dramatically um, different and I think will continue to influence and shape the way um, that young people respond and this, this generation in particular responds to um, military intervention. Great, let's go to Ilya and then Stanislas. Yeah, I think this point about this not being isolationism is a really important one. So, uh, you know, I, I was a foreign relations major. I remember sitting around reading a problem from hell in college and getting incredibly down and thinking, how do we solve the problem? And I think the experience of not just a decade and a half of war, but wars where basically everything that could go wrong did go wrong has been uh, an increased skepticism of chess, of looking at the world as a chessboard where if the U.S. moves a military piece here or there, you know what the outcome will be. And so I think where that puts uh, millennials is in a place of wanting to intervene a lot to make the world a better place, to deal with human rights, to solve challenges they're seeing in part because they're meeting people who have now migrated to the U.S. or migrate or through a foreign exchange program or otherwise. So this isn't about somebody, you know, who's an other. It's somebody who they know. But it's also a really deep skepticism and cynicism that U.S. military might be the answer. And one thing I've noticed in particular is as you see more and more people from around the world in the U.S. who are, you know, coming from countries that are impacted now, particularly the refugee flows, and you suddenly have people in a room in a foreign policy conversation who could say, that's not collateral damage, that's my grandmother you'd be bombing if you went this way. And that experience, I think, means yes to intervention, but not in a military form, but rather figuring out, you know, how do you head off ISIS before it becomes a military threat? And I think the challenge we have is we don't have enough of the answers yet. Too often the question is still presented to us as, do we invade or not, when actually uh, we needed to engage much earlier to present proactive solutions that could have been relevant uh, before it was that late. Dennis Loss. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that uh, it's definitely not a generation of, of isolationism. Uh, it's more so uh, that this generation wants to know exactly what it's getting into. You know, after, after having two wars, you know, that have pretty much uh, not solved the problem. Perhaps it's, it's been argued that it's exacerbated the problem. You know, terrorism attacks in countries such as Pakistan and Iraq were rarities before the war on terror, and now they're a common occurrence. So, you know, we want to know that 
when we go into uh, intervene, will do we have a plan uh, to get out of there and actually have it be, uh, you know, uh, better or more democratic than it than it was uh, going in, or is it going to be something that leads to uh, more extremism, you know, the rise of, of ISIS? Um, and other issues. So I, I feel like this generation is perhaps one that seeks to uh, solve the underlying social issues as opposed to trying to bomb its way out of a, out of, out of a problem. So. I hope you're right. Sarah, you had a few, uh, few other thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to add something, you know, you, this point about war, and, and I think we're looking at a shifting framework, which is going to be so important, particularly for the millennial generation, and that's the framework of IHO, which, the Geneva Conventions, which has guided governments for centuries since the, the end of World War II in terms of how they fought wars. But when you look at uh, a situation where the United States doesn't consider itself a party to a conflict in Yemen, um, and so therefore doesn't think IHL applies, and it doesn't seem uh, to be doing much when civilians are being killed by aerial strikes or cluster munitions on a regular basis. Uh, or you look at the bombing of the MSF hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan. Yes, there's an investigation underway within the U.S. military, but what liability and prosecutions will we see down the road? It throws into question the general framework that has guided the U.S. and other countries for so many decades. And I think increasingly, while a bit legalistic, that's going to be tremendously important for the next generation, future generations, um, as they engage in foreign policy, because ISIS, as an example, certainly has thrown that framework under the bus. They don't care, and it is incumbent upon governments to reinforce the understanding of just how important that is. Totally, and I just want to add uh, on this topic, and then I want to move to, to climate change, but uh, I want to investigate one other little piece here, which is um, the the mechanization, the droneization of war and its relationship to our willingness to intervene. Um, you know, it seems to me like there's a very scary, interesting, complicated nexus there. Um, you know, personally, I don't know. I, I haven't had a friend die in a war. I haven't had a friend be drafted. I've never feared to be drafted myself in any deep way. Um, and all of those things probably affect, you know, how I feel about what war means to me and the people I know. And um, that's partly a socioeconomic thing, but it's also partly a, uh, you know, we can, we can uh, send in drones without worrying about that thing. Um, so... You know, I think the, the danger and the challenge is that uh, intervention feels in some ways um, less scary on a personal... We've got less skin in the game, literally speaking, than we ever did. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the consequences on the ground are any less dire or, or complicated for uh, the folks that were bombing or, or invading with, with drones. Um, so, you know, to me, that's one of the central areas to figure out is kind of there used to be, I think, more of a basic political check on intervention because you'd have to put up people uh, than there is now. And I think that, that really shifts the dynamics in some, in some really problematic ways. Um, so on that happy note, uh, let us shift to climate change and... Uh, I would love to hear uh, from folks, you know, how, how is climate change going to shape uh, foreign policy uh, and how millennials think about foreign policy and both, um, you know, the, the positive sides of that and the negative sides of it. Just to kick off uh, on a more optimistic note, I mean, I think this is a global threat that affects the whole world and that requires the whole world to act together to fix it and I think um, you know we haven't faced many of those that are as clear in world history I think the the promise here is that this can actually help us develop new muscles for working together 
um, internationally that may be useful across a wide variety of issues and and in a less rigid way than than the, the pre-existing ones. But how do folks think that climate change is going to affect um, you know the next twenty years of of foreign policy? Robert. Yeah, I, I think it's fundamental. I think it's going to be one of the main things that shapes foreign policy and shapes the way millennials look at it. You know, I go to a point that Taylor's been making uh, all day, and I think it's an important one, is that there are different cohorts within the millennial group. And for those of us who are sort of the older cohort, you know, even before Bush decided to invade Iraq, he pulled the United States out of the Kyoto Treaty. And I think that was the first big signal to a lot of maybe older millennials that uh, Bush is going to pursue a unilateral foreign policy and that there's something wrong with that, especially facing the threat of climate change. I think what climate change does is just destroy the reputation of unilateral American exceptionalism among millennials as a way to solve problems. I think uh, it also encourages millennials to be willing to shake up uh, failed institutions at home and abroad and around the world and how they're uh, responding or in many cases failing to respond. I see a lot of millennials engaged with, uh, for example, the Paris peace talk, or the Paris uh, climate talks. I've got a lot of people I know who are politically aware uh, talk a lot about it. I think it really grabbed their uh, attention. But the question is, you know, where do we go from here? There are a lot of entrenched forces and a lot of entrenched money uh, invested in the fossil fuel economy, invested in the current system. And the question is, you know, not only how do we challenge it, but how do we challenge that in ways that are much more egalitarian? How do we challenge that in ways that include everyone around the world in a more democratic and uh, equitable way rather than just, well, here's the American answer and we're going to impose it on all of you. Uh, I think millennials really have an opportunity here and I think the desire to collaborate with the people they're making the connections with online around the world to figure out what is actually a solution to look like that works for everybody. So that's one of the places I'm most optimistic about millennial foreign policies. I think millennials are going to be the ones to lead the way through that. All right, let's go to Taylor. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Um, again, when we did our internal survey, and, and just to, to expand our cohort, you know, 95% are voters, those who can't, uh, the other 5% are those who can't vote. Um, highly politically engaged, the folks going to be jumping into political and policy jobs later on. Um, across all the different policy areas that we surveyed on, um, the issue that was of highest consensus was the need to tackle money in politics, but the second highest consensus was the need to strengthen international institutions to tackle climate change, uh, which I think that the, the description, the choice to describe it as strengthening international institutions to get the job done is a really important distinguishing factor of that, whether it's going to happen, we'll see. But I do think that um, I, I would then put a premium on what happens after these talks. I think a lot of energy and momentum went into getting us to this point. I think um, a lot of potential to continue to drive momentum on it or rest on actual action happening across the country, which is why the work of so many different organizations on this is so critical. Uh, and so important, and I, and I think that, you know, to what many have spoken to is deeply tied up into these other questions around um, uh, belief in institutions and the role of institutions. I also think there's a real moment and need to tie climate change to human rights issues as well, uh, and I don't think we do that enough. Uh, we've been talking a lot about millennials as different cohorts, but often millennials is actually often used as a terminology to describe the trends among upper middle class white millennials. Um, and that can be very problematic. Uh, and we're, particularly when we're talking about what's happening here in the states, what's happening globally between the relationship between people of color and their and state actors, um, we can't ignore that. And to recognize this, this, this existential question around safety and rights um, and security are tied up in both climate change and human rights. And I think there's real potential to combine those two more clearly in our movements, um, combine those two issues. Great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think two similar thoughts. So one is that, I mean, this point about frontline communities uh, being disproportionately underrepresented groups is really important, whether it's in the U.S. or globally. When you're talking about people who are on the front lines of being impacted by climate change, they tend to be uh, poor, they tend to be people of color, they tend to be uh, people who traditionally haven't had much power and haven't, you know, uh, been in, you know, ha generally are in the global south, but even within the U.S., you know, where is the impact going to be? It's going to be in poor, underrepresented communities. And I think the question of how does the system respond to the needs of the global south, of folks who are migrating, of folks who are on the front lines of the climate crisis, of native communities that are suffering 
because of what more industrialized societies have done is going to be a, a tremendous challenge to figure out, one that has to be addressed uh, because the needs of those communities need to be front and center. And then the second piece, you know, in the U.S., if you look now at sort of the origins of a lot of um, people's political engagement, particularly on the left, a lot of it came from opposition to the war in Iraq, at least for a certain cohort, you know, the Dean generation or however we want to call it. Uh, and I think what you'll see with globally and likely in the U.S. is a new generation of people entering politics whose entry point is the climate movement, particularly in places where governments are not responsive. So if you look at an Australia, if you look at a Canada up until the recent election, you found a lot of people who were organizing on climate, who were part of civil society, saw their country as a state actor standing in the way and decided to use political change as a means, as a vehicle for change. And I think you'll see that more and more that when governments stand in the way of the climate movement, uh, civil society will push back, and that'll be a mobilizing force to actually change governments if they're not responsive, given how urgently millennials feel this need, because it's happening now. Stanislaus. Yes, uh, definitely uh, to jump on Ilya's point, uh, I, I do believe that millennials are going to play a role in terms of uh, holding governments accountable, as we did see in the... Uh, the protests uh, happening all over the world during the Paris climate talks to push governments to actually come to an agreement uh, because it's something that you know millennials really care about and uh, really see as a as a defining issue of our age. And on, at the same time, I believe that the if we're able to if we're successful in uh, really, I guess, you know effectively combating climate change, it'll create a, a new framework for how we uh, resolve issues in the future, such as, uh, you know, uh, global terrorism, um, you know, economic disparities, other issues like that. I believe that if we're able to solve this issue using civil society, uh, it'll create a sort of framework for the future. Great. And Sarah? I just wanted to pick up on the on the point that Taylor made about the 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 interlinks between climate change and human rights because I think actually it's going to be quite easy to deal with the people that are not on the front lines because it is often the more impoverished, alienated, different ethnic communities that central governments don't want to deal with. If you think of the Turkana people up by the lakes in Kenya, which are so far removed from the incredible, incredibly growing middle class capital of Nairobi, that's going to require a lot of work to engage with those communities and make sure that they are safe from receding um, lakes and, and access to water. And so, so a really comprehensive and broad-based approach to doing climate change effectively requires thinking about a lot of issues that many governments don't want to think about, including in some cases the U.S. government. And so I think it, for those who are out and pushing for climate change to be part of foreign policy, as it rightly sh should going forward, it's got to keep, um, the push has to continue to be really comprehensive so that many people that are many communities that are often forgotten about by governments are not forgotten about this time around. One of the uh, big conversations around climate change is sort of to what degree is this driven by technological change versus government agreements, right? And, um, you know, I think there's a, let's just drop the price of uh, renewables until they're way below carbon school and they're like, we'll never get there that way, um, which is a little bit in the U.S. kind of an East Coast, West Coast uh, divide. Um, where do you think, uh, like, how do you think millennials understand that conversation, think about it? Obviously, I think uh, the, the technological, technology as a locus of m massive change is a powerful message for uh, folks who have lived through this last uh, couple of decades, but, um, but you know, uh, as we get into the thick of, of how do you solve this, um, I feel like that's going to become a bigger and bigger piece of the conversation. I guess another way to say it is, is you know, uh, in terms of one set of policies that are going to be, you know, really investing in the energy of the future versus another set of policies that are going to be carbon taxes and regulatory, you know, how do you think millennials think about that? 
Ilya, do you have any any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think there's a real, you know, one of the questions for millennials is where, you know, which institutions to put your resources and effort in. And so I think one of the things we've seen is, uh, for better or worse, a shift from uh, government and international institutions to um, nonprofit, civil society, and the tech sector. And I think the question there's a there's a values question of whether we think that's good or bad. Um, so I, I I think it's to be determined. Like uh, you know I think from my perspective, um, getting more people with a, a shared value set into places with existing power is actually really valuable, and that means actually channeling people towards governments that can move tremendous resources around. Um, but I think what we are seeing is there's an allure to whether it's Silicon Valley or otherwise to using to you know. Uh, to innovating and using technology to find solutions. And I think there's there's just a question around whether it's fundamentally an economic problem or a values problem. And I think the question of how much urgency you see around climate change can help dictate your answer. That if you think we're running out of time, then fundamentally it's a question of values and priorities. If you think we can innovate our way out of our problem, even if it takes longer, then I think you go to the tech sector. But I think that that's a place where I, I suspect there's a big split depending on what you're drawn to. What other thing? All right, let me skip on to the to the next uh, question. Um, and it was sort of spurred by this conversation, actually, which is, uh, you know, I wonder whether this whole way of thinking about issue sets is is shifting. Um, and and some of the stuff that you were talking about that Stanislas uh, also also made me made me want to ask like I wonder if the framework of foreign policy issues and domestic issues is just that's actually one of the things that's going to shift in a millennial world because so few of them actually are bounded by you know, the national borders, whether you're talking about climate change, whether you're talking about the world economy, you know, it's hard to talk about the domestic economy as something separate from the world economy anymore. Um, you know, how do folks think about sort of, is this even a useful category uh, at this point in time, or is it something that's going to evolve? Uh, I'll chime in here. Uh, I, I would say that definitely, uh, uh, domestic and uh, international foreign policy are extremely intertwined. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, work interning uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon, one of the uh, most difficult, uh, I think, tasks was, uh, I guess, addressing like overcrowding in prisons in Cameroon. But uh, that really was really tough to, to address because we have the highest prison population per capita in the world. So it's you know so you know you have to think about you know the way you approach uh, the issue in a more I guess strategic way that doesn't uh, make make I guess you you know you and your country look you know terrible and hypocritical. Uh, so definitely, I think one of the aims for uh, millennials millennials will be to try to address more domestic issues, you know, issues on race, uh, economics, uh, you know, uh, gender issues, uh, more, I guess, in a more profound way uh, before approaching uh, uh, the issues of other countries. I think, I think that's uh, the stance that we'll see more, more of. Great. Robert? Oh, sorry, Sarah, actually. Uh, Sarah, you want to jump in? Sure, really quickly. I mean, I think it depends. You know, let's look at development aid, for example. Development aid is like 0.7% of the U.S. budget, and yet it's been blown up to, 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 to seem as if it's, you know, 55% of the U.S. budget. And yet some people are adamantly against the U.S. providing funds abroad because they see there is a very legitimate need here at home, whether it's bridges and highways or the, you know, the impact of the economic recession. And so I think, you know, the answer is sometimes you're going to see an interlink between domestic and foreign. And sometimes you're going to see a real split. And that may be 
based on personal experience and maybe on you know an understanding of what it means. I personally believe that there is this short versus long-term implication for how the U.S. engages. But I do think in, in a lot of ways it comes down to personal experience and understanding of how the U.S. does business abroad with, a, with an expectation that at the same time the U.S. is still going to be taking care of its own. Robert. Uh, quickly, you know, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is uh, trade deals like the TPP, and these are fundamentally bringing together, you know, the international and the national. Uh, we're already starting to see that because of previous trade deals, you know, things we might want to do uh, through state legislatures or congressional action are suddenly being overturned uh, in these, you know, trade courts or trade commissions. Uh, so I think that that right there is going to force us to think about how we structure. Uh, our economic uh, objectives in a way that you know not only conforms with whatever you know international structures we're putting together, but also how we talk to we other countries about putting together a more equitable uh, distribution of resources. So uh, we're in the final ten minutes here of our conversation, and um, as we start to uh, wrap, I would love to ask folks, um, you know, when you think about the uh, millennial generation and foreign policy, what are the places that really give you hope? Uh, what are the places that you feel inspired and excited about the way that uh, this generation is going to shape uh, the, the future of the world? Um, and why don't we start with Ilya as our resident, uh, resident optimist here? Um, sure. I mean, I'll speak to two things. So one is I think the non-othering that's happening by this generation is an incredible plus, whether it's the studying abroad that folks have talked to Stanislav and others have talked about, whether it's the migration of people from new places to the U.S., including, yes, migration of refugees. I think as there's more contact in person or mediated by technology with people around the world, uh, it becomes harder to support unnecessary military engagement because collateral damage becomes not a distant concept, but somebody you've met or somebody's family. So I think that's a plus. I think the more we can prevent unnecessary wars, uh, the better shape we'll be. And then the second piece I'll say is the, the growing interconnectedness of civil society around the world, uh, primarily happening because of climate change and the need to address that globally. I think the potential of that is going to be massive. It's still unexplored. But if we can figure out how non-state actors from around the world citizen-led movements can connect and can build in each other's power and can cross-pollinate in the way that an Egypt can inspire a Wisconsin, I think you're going to see uh, potentially a significant power shift away from those with institutional power right now to citizenry and to having people feel like they have some agency over foreign policy again. And that would be a tremendous win. Uh, but it's you know years and decades of work ahead of us. Great. Robert? You know, I want to share Ilya's optimism, and I feel like some things we talked about really speak to that. Millennials really do believe that we should be intervening humanitarianly around the world. Uh, you know, we should not just see a problem or a crisis or people suffering and turn away and say that's not our problem. I think that's incredibly positive. I think millennials really want to solve the deeper problems such as climate change that uh, previous in previous years have not really been addressed or been swept under the rug. And I feel like millennials want to do it in a way that is going to provide lasting solutions. Uh, but we're facing challenges, and we're facing resistance in countries across the uh, globe here at home. And I think the real defining challenge that millennials face, especially in the next five to ten years, is how do they deal with these obstacles? How do they deal with the resistance that's being put in front of them? And I think the answer to that, how millennials respond to that, is going to define what millennial foreign policy looks like. Great. Stanislav? Stanislav. Yeah, uh, what I'm most optimistic about is I, I believe uh, millennials won't be as rash uh, in terms of intervention as uh, uh, previous generations may have been. Uh, just mainly from learning, learning from the uh, past mistakes and uh, disasters that have uh, come from that. Uh, I, I believe millennials will try to analyze a problem and look at underlying underlying social issues. Uh, and look for ways to, you know, support institutions as opposed to intervening for first. Uh, and I think that's something to be uh, very optimistic about to try to prevent unnecessary uh, wars or conflict in the future. Sarah, do you want to jump in? Sure. 
Um, I, I, you know, I have a couple of thoughts. I think, um, to begin with, I think millennials have really realized that they uh, can make their government pay attention to them, and that's tremendously important, whether it's the executive branch or Congress. I was in Congress when college students and Americans around the country mobilized in support of the, um, the LRA bill, the Lord's Resistance Army, and it was an amazing thing to watch Americans uh, young Americans engage on such a, an issue that you know five years prior nobody had heard of. So with a little education and a lot of heart, I think there's an understanding that they can make a difference and they can make a change, and that th that that is a tremendous positive um, overall. But the second thing is, I, I think Stanislaus said it right. There's a comprehensive understanding that it's not just either or. Human rights and values are not separate from national security interests, that there's sort of an interconnectedness and, and there needs to be an integrated foreign policy to think about how one impacts the other. That's a tremendous success over the long term uh, if foreign policy moves in that direction. And it's one I hear repeatedly from millennials um, to, uh, as, a, as an important priority for them. Taylor? Yeah, I, I think going last, everyone said all the smart things. Um, I, I, I think just to build, I think it's um, the appreciation or the desire to tackle structural issues with an appreciation with the complexity that shapes them, uh, and then the ability to prior like the focus it on pragmatic over ideological. I will say um, just to add a little bit of a fun spin on it. I think uh, the as someone who does a lot of research and work on you know what gets young people to engage politically. One of the primary driving factors is uh, the conversations that parents have with their kids around the dinner table. Um, do they talk about the world? Do they have to talk about what's happening an ocean away? It's what gets the kids who may not have the chance to study abroad to think about themselves beyond their living room. Um, and I guess I have a lot of optimism for the kinds of conversations that millennials will have with their kids. And we're talking about issues that are going to take generations of hard work. Um, and so I'm optimistic about the set of values that drive this generation and the way that they'll shape the generations to come. Yeah, I agree with uh, a lot of what has been said here, and um, you know, especially the piece around uh, just a world that is more empathic uh, and a generation that's more empathic. And I think that uh, if you look at some of the research on kind of generational values and norms, um, one of the things you see across the world is that as people uh, grow up in a environment which is a little less focused on meeting basic needs and a little bit more focused on uh, uh, the higher parts of Maslow's hierarchy, mm -hmm. people have more kind of space and an ability to think about um, what life is like for others and how to how to help them. And I think um, you know that ethos can be dangerous. Uh, it, you know, there's there's some research even that um, empathy in the wrong hands can lead to more violence because you feel so bad about uh, what's happening to someone that you viscerally want to do something. But I think the uh, opportunity there is just enormous. And uh, and I think the second piece is, and I think this whole conversation has reflected this, an appreciation of the complexity of the systems that we're dealing with um, and that uh, this is a nonlinear world uh, you know, actions don't automatically create certain reactions, and um, one has to be very thoughtful and, and careful and humble about uh, understanding the limits of our own power and the limits of our ability to, um, you know, to, to shape things. I think that's something that um, is a much more tangible part of experience for our cohort than it maybe has been for folks past. Um, Certainly, in this conversation, uh, we've touched on a whole variety of challenges, and uh, you know, I think you know, going from uh, the demographic shifts to the wealth concentration to uh, drones and the uh, surveillance state can leave your head spinning and uh, and and you know make it feel a little bit like we're operating in a in a uh, bad science fiction movie, um, but I think. You know, I, I really uh, take away uh, the the positive part of this conversation, which is um, there is this deep 
moral and ethical engagement with all of it. The reaction to all of that is not to turn away, is to say, how do we roll up our hands and figure this stuff out? And to me, that's an incredibly uh, encouraging sign. So um, I want to thank everybody who was part of the conversation. I've learned a lot here, uh, and myself sort of uh, uh, gotten a sense of other perspectives on a lot of these important topics. It's a really, really uh, great and smart group of folks. And uh, thank you, and I'll turn things back over to Peter. Wow. Thank you. I want to actually add my thanks here from reInvent uh, for an exceptionally thoughtful and exceptionally, in the end, optimistic and positive kind of hit on this topic. Uh, thanks to Eli. Thanks to all of you. And thanks for those of you watching. Just do remember, uh, spread the word with this. It's a great uh, roundtable here. Spread it around. There's podcast versions of this coming off of this. And then we'll have short videos as well as short uh, charts and graphics and posts to uh, spread the words around. Okay. Anyhow, thanks for all, and uh, we'll see you next time.